Okay, I'm sorry, everyone, if you could just grab your food and come back. We're going to start again. My iPhone tells me it's exactly 1 o'clock. So my name is Mary Lovely. I'm a visiting fellow here at the Peterson Institute. I'm very happy to be with you all today for this conference uh, on the policy implications of sustained low productivity growth. Our next session is on social protection and health. And we are fortunate to have two experts here with us today to discuss the issue. Our first speaker will be Dr. Axel Borchupin. Dr. Borchupin is the director of the Munich Center for the Economics of Aging which is a department of the Max Planck Institute for Social Law and Social Policy in Munich. He received his PhD in economics from MIT. Before joining the Max Planck Institute, Dr. Borchupin taught at Harvard University, the University of Dortmund, and the University of Mannheim. We're very happy he came all the way across the pond to be with us today. Our second speaker is Louise Schainer. Dr. Shainer is the Robert S. Kerr Senior Fellow in Economic Studies and Policy Director for the Hutchins Center on Fiscal and Monetary Policy at the Brookings Institution. She received her PhD from Harvard University. Before joining Brookings, Dr. Shainer held senior economist positions at the Federal Reserve Board of Governors, the U.S. Department of the Treasury, and President Clinton's Council of Economic Advisors. Dr. Shainer came all the way acro from across the street today, and we're very happy that she joined us. We can, you can see we're well represented by the, fresh, the uh, saltwater schools uh, in Cambridge. So thank you both for being here. Our discussant is uh, Dr. Jeremy Settlemeyer. He is a senior fellow here at the Peterson Institute for International Economics. Just before joining the Peterson Institute, he served as Director General for Economic Policy at the German Federal Ministry for Economic Affairs and Energy. Dr. Zettelmeyer also represented Germany at the OECD Economic Policy Committee and served as founding co-chair of the OECD's Global Forum on Productivity. After we have our speech, we'll invite everyone to the podium and take questions. So please, Dr. Borchupan, I invite you to the lectern. That's the only way to see the screen, right? Good. Uh, sorry to disturb your lunch. Uh, <laughs> we'll uh, talk about the most uh, exciting topic uh, under the sun, which is pension systems. Uh, and uh, I'm actually quite glad to be here in Washington, D.C. Uh, and. Uh, even though it's longer than across the street, uh, I, I, I do appreciate the travel here. Um, <clears throat> so the, the um, uh, let me actually, whoops. Okay, so let me uh, briefly introduce what my task is here. Uh, I will take the productivity slowdown, which we have uh, now, uh, now talked about all morning uh, as given. Uh, will not really think about the, uh, the, uh, the, the causes for this, even though there may be some correlation uh, b between the causes and social systems, but uh, that, that is not an issue here. Um, and uh, the, the, the main question is uh, to research how uh, this productivity slowdown will affect the adequacy of pension benefits. Uh, and I will put some stress on the European pension systems, uh, but, but there are a lot of applications in the US as well. Um, the, uh, the system in, in the U.S. is actually uh, more European than uh, many Americans may, uh, may actually think. Um, <clears throat> and uh, well, what I'm particularly interested in, uh, and this comes uh, because I'm a director of the uh, uh, Munich Center for the Economics of Aging, uh, is to see the, uh, how this is affected in times of population aging. So we not only have a... Uh, a big bang in terms of, uh, of uh, the, the, the problems with the baby boomers. Uh, in addition, we have the productivity slowdown. Uh, and the main question is, will that uh, destroy, uh, to, to put it strongly, our pension systems? Uh, the, the second question is related to this, uh, what happens to financial sustainability of these systems? Uh, 
uh, which are, is anyway under pressure because of aging, uh, will that pressure increase? Uh, and the fourth point is the obvious one, uh, uh, if, if we are worried, uh, what is policy? Uh, and what kind of uh, action uh, will, uh, will we have to take? Uh, and there will be a slight of a surprise, uh, as those know uh, who also attended the, uh, the pre-conference here. Um, anyway, uh, I, I will look at two scenarios. One is the baseline scenario. This is uh, if the world uh, would stay as, uh, as it was before, the 99, uh, before 2010 uh, in, the, uh, in the 1990s. Um, so uh, uh, that is the one counterfactual. Um, then we have the productivity slowdown uh, scenario, uh, which uh, is detailed here. That is the scenario which, uh, for, for all of the uh, empirical analysis uh, in this project, uh, will be common. Uh, so it's a decline uh, in productivity of uh, 1.5 per annum, real, uh, per, uh, real wage growth, actually. Uh, to, to 0.9, so we get a gap of, uh, of about 0.6% uh, uh, per year. Now, <clears throat> if, if you think about pensions, then productivity is not an immediate parameter. It's wage growth, uh, which is important. And underlying here is the assumption that productivity and wage uh, will grow one-to-one. Uh, -one. Okay, that's an important assumption. Doesn't have to be, and uh, we, we have seen in the in the in the past uh, that, that there's often a divergence in the short run. In the long run, this is a pretty good assumption. Um, okay. <clears throat> um, then I have a third scenario, and uh, this is something new and alien to to, to, to the other papers. Uh, and I called it aging slowdown. Now that is a very, uh, actually I, I use American euphemism here at the extreme. Aging slowdown sh sounds really like a great thing to have, right? We all stay young. Uh, actually exactly the opposite is meant. Uh, no progress anymore in life expectancy. Uh, that is a scenario which seems completely unrealistic in, in Europe where you have completely linear uh, increase in life expectancy. It's not so unrealistic, by the way, for the United States, uh, where you have uh, large parts of the, uh, of the population where uh, life expectancy is stagnant and some parts uh, where it even goes down. Um, so uh, uh, I use this scenario just to show <clears throat> the orders of magnitude. So we have population in one hand, uh, population aging, uh, we have uh, productivity slowdown, we won't have some measure how large these effects actually are. Okay? Now, the, you have seen the first uh, four points. Uh, uh, the main result is uh, uh, the, the, the favorite of every economist, uh, it depends. Uh, and uh, it very much depends on the, on the kind of pension system that we have. That, that is why uh, uh, the next five minutes, you, you get Pension Economics 101, uh, and uh, you see how uh, these different pension systems react very, very different to the productivity slowdown. Um, okay, pension systems. Um, they're pay-as-you-go pension systems, like the uh, US Social Security system, uh, which are essentially defined by uh, expenditure equal to, uh, to, uh, uh, to inflows. Uh, <clears throat> Um, and then there's, uh, so the, the, the key here is one generation pays the next generation, okay? And uh, this is sort of a game which goes from generation to generation. Uh, but uh, whatever you give more to one generation, the other generation has to pay for. That's the important thing here. The fully funded system are very different. Uh, one generation pays in a fund, whatever fund that is. Uh, and then later we'll actually take from that fund. So on a very superficial note, there's no linkage between generations. Um, okay, so that, that's one very important dimension of differences between pension system, number one. Uh, number two here is uh, 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 what uh, <clears throat> some people refer to as Bismarckian versus Beveridgean systems. Uh, Bismarckian systems are earnings related, so if you earn more, your pension is, uh, is higher. And now if you think about productivity slowdown, that's an important uh, kind of property uh, because obviously that links wages one-to-one -to, -one to, uh, to, to pensions. Whereas the Beveridgian, uh, uh, the typically UK kind of, uh, of pension system, gives you a flat non-earnings related benefit, which may be indexed to something. 
uh, but definitely not to your lifetime income. Hmm? Now, the, the, the third layer of difference is between defined benefits and defined contribution. Uh, that is a, a very important kind of uh, dimension if you think about intergenerational uh, redistribution. Uh, defined benefit, uh, you get pr a pension promise at the beginning of your career, and then the sponsor of the pension plan, which may be the U.S. government or a company, uh, then has to fulfill that promise. Uh, whereas the D.C. kind of uh, defined contribution system, uh, uh, they, you pay in, and uh, then the, uh, the evolution of the economy in terms of the interest rate or whatever else, determines the rate of return of that pension system uh, will be a risk, uh, and depending on that, your pension will be higher or lower. So one is an ex-ante promise of a pension, uh, the, the other one is an ex-post realization uh, of a lifetime stream of return. And again, if you think about uh, uh, events, macroeconomic events like productivity slowdown or population aging for that sense, uh, that makes a big sense, a, a big difference, uh, whether it affects the uh, generation of pensioners or the uh, generation of uh, payees into the pension system, whoever they are. Okay? So these are the three dimensions, and you can combine almost everything with everything. Uh, we, we look at, uh, so you, you generate these different kind of systems. Um, now, let's, let's um, <clears throat> and as I said, I will look at financial sustainability and pension adequacy. Let's actually go a little bit further in, uh, in, in, in this pension economics 101 and, uh, and uh, think a, bit, a little bit how a pension systems work. Uh, let's start with the pay-as-you-go system. The first key equation is the identity of revenues and expenditures in an abstract way. Um, and uh, so the first equation tells you that the, uh, the tax rate times the wage uh, times the number of workers uh, has to be the pension, the average pension, times the number of pensioners. Very trivial, uh, but that's the first key equation. The second key equation is the determination of either the replacement rate uh, or the contribution rate, depending whether the system is DB or DC, uh, defined benefit or defined contribution. Uh, and you see, I go through uh, the, the, the case of the DB system where you have uh, a politically determined replacement rate, uh, which immediately implies that the contribution rate of the younger generation will react to macroeconomic shocks. Okay, so there's a political process uh, which determines uh, what, what is promised uh, to, to, to the older generation, and the younger generation will pay for it whatever it costs. That is, in some sense, what you have in U.S. Social Security. Uh, now, the opposite is, uh, is DC system. You have a fixed contribution rate, and then you will see uh, what, uh, what comes out. Uh, this is, in some sense, what you have in the U.S. as uh, IRAs or 401ks, uh, which work by the, uh, by the DC system. Now, DB and DC sounds like uh, this is either or, uh, but that is definitely wrong. You can have any kind of mixture between the two. And we don't want to go through the math, but uh, you can have, it's a continuum between these two, uh, two systems, uh, and you can parameterize this with the weight alpha, which I've given here, uh, to, the, uh, <clears throat> uh, to the DC part. Um, it's important to, to remember that the internal rate of return of a uh, pension system uh, that's the last uh, equation here, is G plus N. And you may remember G plus N we have seen today at various times. Uh, if you compare this to a fully funded system, obviously the rate of return is the interest rate. And you have exactly what we were worried about all morning, uh, whether R is uh, larger than G plus N or, uh, uh, or the other way around. Uh, the alpha actually uh, explains how much demography enters the, uh, the rate of return. That depends on the DC DB characteristic. Uh, but uh, th this fundamental uh, 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 balance between R uh, of the capital market uh, and the natural rate of growth, N plus G, uh, is also very important for pension economics. Now this is the macro, uh, so Z system in general. Uh, then on the micro level, uh, pension benefits are very often very complicated, but they are uh, calculated just to make things easy. So there's the replacement rate, 
then uh, in the earnings system, uh, they, they may depend on your lifetime earnings or they may be flat. Uh, that determines the S, uh, and uh, that's slightly out of, uh, uh, of line. Um, <clears throat> it also depends when, when you actually claim your pension. Uh, as you know, in the United States, uh, you can start your uh, Social Security at 62. <clears throat> Excuse me, at 62, and I think you have to claim by 72. Uh, uh, you, you cannot shift claiming any longer. Uh, but if you claim later, then your pension will be higher. If you claim earlier, your pension will be lower. That can be actually fair or not fair, uh, but these are secondary uh, uh, kind of considerations. Uh, but this is the essence of a pension system. And you see that there, there, are, there are quite a few parameters where you can play with, uh, and they will actually uh, play a role in uh, whether uh, a productivity slowdown affects the younger generation, the older generation, uh, and how much. Um, now, a fully funded system works much easier. Uh, your pension is uh, just the interest uh, on, uh, on your capital, which you paid in. Um, and uh, if it's a DC system, R is the realized uh, capital market ex post performance, ex post. Uh, if it's a DB system, then uh, it's ex ante promised uh, and the sponsor has to, to, to bear the risk. Uh, so that, that, that's much more straightforward. Okay, let, let's just think about what, what happens with the a, with a, with a productivity slowdown. Now, if benefit are indexed to wages, Just go think about the first uh, equation where, uh, where uh, 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 you think about the income in a pension system, which is the tax rate times the wages, times the number of people. Uh, then the right-hand side, the expenditure, is the replacement rate times the wages times the number of pensioners. So the wages just cancel uh, on both sides of the equation. And that tells you immediately that a productivity slowdown, uh, which, in, which decreases wages, does not ha have any effect on the budget equation, just cancels out. Now, that's a triviality if you think about it. Uh, but it tells you immediately that I should now leave here and uh, we go to the discussion because nothing will happen, right? That's an important insight. Uh, and uh, but that depends obviously uh, on the strict indexation of uh, pension benefits to, 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 to wages. So you neither have an effect on financial sustainability, nor in that sense, in the relative sense, on adequacy of pensions, because you get the same replacement rate. Now that doesn't mean that the absolute level of pensions, that of course will go down. But the entire economy will go down and shrink proportionally. So if you think of a person in that system uh, as only looking at uh, things which happen in the system right now, they won't even see its change. Huh? That is a very abstract notion. If you're German and uh, uh, productivity goes down, you may actually look across the Rhine uh, and see the French who have a higher pension. And then you start complaining. You may also have some memory and think about your parents who had a much more generous uh, uh, pension because they were in times of higher productivity. So absolute uh, pension level may also be, uh, play a role. Uh, and uh, we'll, we'll actually look at that in, uh, in a moment. There are also tons of more complications in the real world. Now, the, in the United States, pensions are indexed to wages very strictly at the point of entry into the system when you claim your pension. But from there on, uh, pensions are actually indexed uh, to, to cost of living, the COLA uh, index. So that actually uh, changes the, uh, the, the view um, because you, in the beginning, you're actually fully, uh, fully covered, uh, but then it, uh, it ch there will be relative changes in, uh, in the pension versus uh, the wages. That's different in other countries. In Germany, for example, uh, 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 benefits until your death are indexed uh, to, to, to wages, maybe even after that. Um, <laughs> uh, there, there, there will be uh, all kinds of feedback effects in equilibrium, uh, uh, but I don't really look at them. The wages may actually respond to, uh, in a different way than uh, the interest rate. Uh, okay. Um, <clears throat> now, if benefits are only inflation indexed, 
Then something ironic happens. Um, because the productivity is slowing down, uh, so uh, wages will actually go down, but pensions will not. So a productivity slowdown actually makes, at least in relative terms, pensioners better off uh, at the expense of the younger generation, of course. Huh? Uh, but that's a different mechanism. Let me look at pension adequacy in absolute terms. Now, uh, very often uh, the, the, there is this, uh, does that work? Yeah. There's the perception that wages go up, but uh, due to population aging, public pensions go down, uh, and they eventually reach the floor of whatever, uh, in Europe you have social assistance, in, in, in the US this will be zero. Um, th but that is a, uh, that's definitely a misperception. What, what, what actually happens is that uh, 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 public pensions will still rise, uh, but less than wages. There will be a sort of a wedge uh, between the development. Why is that so? Um, the intuition here is uh, when productivity increases with 1.5%, as in the baseline scenario, for the pensions, uh, however they're financed, you sort of have to subtract the loss of resources due to population aging. And that is the number you can actually compute, and that's in the order of half a percent a year in countries which age as fast as Germany or, or Italy, uh, Japan a little bit more. But there's still, if you subtract half from uh, 1.5, there's still 1% left. Now, obviously, if, if you have a productivity slowdown, the 1.5% is now 0.9%. Now subtract from that uh, half percent, well, there's only 0.4% left, but that is still positive. So even on an absolute scale, adequacy is not really threatened in these kind of economies unless productivity slowdown uh, is larger than, uh, uh, than the half percent. Um, then nothing is left over. Okay? So this essentially tells you the entire story what happens to pensions. Okay? Uh, a absolute adequacy is not in danger. Relative uh, anyway not. Uh, things are a little bit more complicated when we have pensions which are not indexed to wages, but uh, say to COLA or, or whatever other index. Now, we, we spend actually a lot of uh, time in, in running this through pension simulation models, but what you will see is nothing else uh, than, uh, than, than the previous in intuition. So I do this in the remaining one and a half minutes very quickly. Uh, that's sort of the bread and butter of, uh, of uh, um, what we do in a more careful uh, pension analysis, uh, but uh, there's nothing more to learn in that sense. So for, a, for an earnings-related DB system, there's no difference uh, in the contribution rate between the baseline and the productivity slowdown because of that indexing mechanism. Whereas there's a huge difference. Uh, the pension becomes much less under pressure uh, if we don't have increases in life expectancy anymore, right? Okay, the same ha uh, happens now just on the flip side in earnings-related disease system. Now for the younger generation, again, there's no difference between productivity slowdown baseline scenario uh, because everything is fully indexed, but obviously uh, uh, it helps uh, if, uh, if, if, if there's less aging. Um, <clears throat> You can go through the same in a, in a flat benefit system, which is wage indexed, where everybody gets the same pension, but that moves up and down with, uh, with wages. Uh, in some sense, that's the UK system uh, or the, 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 the Dutch system. Uh, again, it makes no difference because it's fully indexed. The only interesting case is uh, if uh, it's inflation adjusted, uh, uh, so there, there is a uh, separation between the, the, the pension uh, payments and uh, what happens to wages. And as I said earlier, uh, then the productivity slowdown actually helps the pension system, ironically, and not the other way around. Uh, you see this in the green uh, productivity slowdown scenario, which... Uh, gives a higher replacement rate uh, at the expense of the younger people, but uh, it, it makes the, uh, the pensioners better off. Okay, uh, very, uh, let me jump over uh, uh, and, and, and think a little bit about uh, uh, adaptation. Now, people may still complain, which I, I told you that because they look from Germany to France, look at another country which has different productivity scenarios, they may uh, remember their parents. Uh, so there may be some political pressure to actually do do something. And I went through a very simple exercise. 
Um, now, the value of, uh, of your pension benefit actually declines when the uh, productivity slowdown uh, occurs. That holds both for fully funded and for pay-as-you-go system. Pay-as-you-go because the uh, productive value, so to speak, of the next generation will be lower because they're less productive uh, in fully funded system because the rate of return will go down. So you have to offset that decrease in value by an increase in volume. Uh, it's a little bit the game we have seen earlier. Uh, if you have less productivity growth, uh, you have to increase more capital or, or labor in the economy. It's exactly the same kind of idea. Now, uh, the 0.6% uh, per annum decrease uh, corresponds to 20% increase uh, uh, of volume necessary between 2020 and 2050. So it's a substantial amount you have to make up in terms of volume. Um, very easy back on the envelope calculation. If you want to retire later, right, and if you think right now uh, a working life is, uh, is, uh, is 40 years, then obviously 20% up uh, tells you 48 years. So if you go to the Senate and ask, please re raise the retirement by eight years, uh, you probably know what, uh, what the senator will tell you. There's a door. Uh, and uh, so that, that is a real, it's an unrealistic option. Right? Even over three years, uh, that is too much. Working more hours, uh, same kind of story, 40 to 48. Um, maybe that works in Singapore or in Asia. Uh, certainly it will not work in France, uh, where you barely have 35 hours. Um, so uh, more immigrants. Uh, th this is the number for Germany, which now has uh, 43 million uh, em employees. You need, need a migration of... Uh, uh, about 250,000 net uh, per annum um, for the next uh, 30 years. Uh, actually, in 2015, Germany had an immigration of 1 million per year. Uh, but uh, at most, one quarter was qualified, uh, probably even less. Uh, and uh, as most of you will know, this uh, almost brought the German uh, political system into uh, uh, in, in, into danger. Uh, so again, that is an unrealistic option for 30 years. Um, uh, save more. Uh, right now, the, the uh, sort of old age uh, saving is in the order of 4%, that increasing to 4.8 system. That seems to be a little bit more, more, uh, more doable. Um, <clears throat> but if, we, if you look at the uptake rates of IRAs in the United States, uh, 401ks, uh, or similar mechanism in other countries, if they are voluntary, then uh, increasing saving uh, by 20% is not trivial either. So the, my, my, uh, I won't talk about education. So uh, my, my conclusion uh, <clears throat> is, uh, let me actually start from, uh, from, from, from the back. Um, if you think about adaptation, you definitely need a very broad policy mix uh, and uh, no single, it, it's too large to compensate, uh, so no, uh, no single um, uh, measure will do. Um, <clears throat> I think I don't have to go through the other points. Uh, uh, a little bit playing on, uh, on, on, on JFK's uh, 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 saying a productivity slowdown lowers the tide for all boats. Uh, and that explains why, uh, uh, why it's fairly neutral uh, if you only look at the local tide. Uh, if, 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 if you look outside of that, then uh, uh, you see this. Uh, luckily, uh, uh, aging is slower than this productivity uh, decline. There's enough left uh, that we still uh, will see an increase in, in absolute terms. Uh, and there's, from, from, from that point of view, I would actually argue uh, that this is, that is a rare case uh, where something major will happen into its system, uh, but I would not really advise for policy action. Thank you. Hi, thank you so much for having me and for inviting me to be part of this project. 
Okay, so um, my mission today is to talk about the effect of slower productivity growth on the fiscal outlook in the United States. It's a completely domestic perspective, um, and some of the things I'm gonna talk about have already been kind of mentioned today, um, and maybe I'll go over them quickly. Um, so as Axel ended, the main thing you have to remember is pro lower productivity growth is bad. It means there's less consumption. Um, you know, so someone is not going to have as much, right? So the question I'm talking about is not whether or not this is a good thing or a bad thing, but how does it affect the government? And will the government have to make adaptations, as Axel used the word, have to change policy, or will policy change automatically? So if you think about you know, Axel's view on the pensions is true of the government in general. So forget about, imagine the government didn't have debt for a second. Then if everything was indexed to GDP, right? So taxes were a constant share of GDP and spending were a constant share of GDP. You know, you could have a slowdown and nothing would happen. Everything would seem fine. Your deficit would be the same as GDP. So everything would be less, right? You'd have lower tax revenues, lower spending, but you wouldn't have to make a policy adjustment. Right, so one question is, let's go through the pieces. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go, go through the pieces of revenues and spending and say, how do they move with GDP, right? Um, when you have debt, as we talked about a lot this morning, the, there is also going to be some separate debt dynamics that depend on um, the growth rate of GDP, and those will importantly be impacted on what you assume about how interest rates move. So I'm going to put all of that together to try to do the whole thing, which is what happens to the fiscal outlook for slowdown productivity. Um, okay, let me quickly go through this productivity slowdown. You've seen a bunch of times. The numbers I use are for labor productivity for the economy as a whole. Karen used for the business sector. It's all the same. We're basically assuming a half a percentage point reduction in TFB for the business sector and seeing what that, ha what, what that is. Um, this is actually to see what CBO is assuming, because this is all I'm going to be comparing to CBO's baseline, which nice in the United States is that CBO does this very um, long pr projection of the fiscal outlook and so then and gives you a lot of the data, so then you can kind of play with the data and change some of the assumptions. So CBO assumes that the slowdown, the productivity, uh, productivity growth is slowly going to go back up to something like a little bit lower than the average uh, over a long period of time, but it's definitely going to rise from where we are right now. And this um, productivity slow producti productivity slowdown says, no, it's actually going to be closer to the average of the past five years, which is actually a step down from the more recent data. Um, and so that's the slowdown. That's the comparison that I'm doing. Um, OK. Um, so one thing that, that, that Axel just mentioned, too, is you know, you you have to ask, what does a productivity slowdown mean for the distribution of income? So we know there's been this widening inequality of income over time, um, that wages at the top has, have gone up and not elsewhere. So you might think, well, if productivity's only been at the top, maybe a productivity slowdown is only going to take it away from the top, and then we'd have more equal distribution. That's one possibility. Another possibility is that one of the, what, what you hear is, why has productivity gone at the top? Well, we've had... Um, uh, productivity growth in some industries very high and productivity growth in other industries not high at all. And one thing that could happen is one of the reasons we've had this um, slowdown of productivity could be that when you have productivity growth in fast, uh, in, in some industries, that productivity growth means you don't need as many workers. And so the workers have to migrate from the high productivity industries to the low productivity industries. That could actually make the wage inequality bigger. So it's ambiguous. And, and it, as you'll see, I have enough things to do not to worry about that. So I'm going to make an assumption that, um, as everybody else has, that the productivity affects wages all through the income distribution. But it is an important. You would get very different results uh, if you assume something different. And it is possible that something different is the right thing to do. And I think that's something that people need to think about a little bit more. Um, and the other thing, as Karen mentioned, she had had some inflation rate. I am going to assume that the Fed manages to hit its target, um, and the, and it doesn't have to change its target. So I'm going to assume the inflation rate is kind of two percent and not affected by the productivity slowdown. Okay. Okay. Uh, so we've talked a lot about the effect of productivity growth on interest rates. It is a very important assumption for doing these projections. Um, I will just add that there has been, there are sort of two ways that people have approached it. One is the way that Neil talked about, which is we've got estimates of the parameter that determines how much you care about consumption smoothing and how much you're going to say, well, if I'm, sp I'm not so rich in the future, then I'm going to save more. That's one way of doing it. Another way is there have been some direct empirical analyses of what is the relationship historically between interest rates and GDP and uh, productivity 
community growth and sort of using Kalman filters to try to get rid of all the other things that's going on. So the most recent paper, Lavak and Williams did in 2015, found that the, the a one percentage point reduction in productivity would lower interest rates by 1.3 percentage points. So not the two um, that Neil was talking about, but more than one. Um, Hamilton and I'll argue, uh, argue that, that the empirical evidence for the relationship is weak, and actually Tom Laubach, who wrote that paper, uh, was said something at a conference about how, you know, that the confidence intervals are so wide you could drive a truck through them. So um, we have this idea that from theory and some empirical evidence that, that, it, that productivity growth should be related to interest rates, but there is a huge band of uncertainty. Um, so what I do is I'm going to show you when I do the analysis, I three, do three scenarios. No effect, interest rates do not move with productivity a one-for-one one effect, and I'll go to Neil's two-for-one effect, and I'll just show you how that matters, okay? Um, okay, so what's the remainder of my presentation? I'm going to have to go through the effects of low productivity on revenues, non-interest spending, and debt sustainability. So I'm going to go through the pieces. Um, and because I like to do a lot of things, I'm going to do the federal sector and some state and local as well. <laughs> and partly is because the state and local sector in the United States is very difficult to do. There's no CBO, um, but it's almost half the size of the federal sector. It's important and it's really understudied uh, because it's so, so difficult. And you'll see I can only make little comments. I can't really do the same full treatment that I can for the federal sector, but I think it's always worth to add a little state and local when you can. Um, so I will, if I have time. Um, okay, so let's first go through the federal. I'm just going to go federal first. Okay, so composition of taxes. Oops, sorry. About almost half of uh, federal taxes come from individual income taxes. 34% uh, payroll, a little bit of corporate income. It's not that big, even though we talk about it all the time these days. And then a bunch of other excise taxes and other cats and dogs. Um, so payroll taxes move with payroll. So if productivity moves with payroll, then there's not going to be any difference. So the payroll taxes as a share of GDP, and this is all about figuring out how do things change as a share of GDP, are not going to be affected. Um, there's a little bit of payroll taxes that have some progressive element, where, but, but it's very small. Okay, So in the United States, just forget about that one. Corporate also basically moves with GDP. Um, the, the, real point, the real place where this matters is the individual income tax. As Karen mentioned, uh, what we call real bracket creeps is as, that as we get richer, people move into higher tax brackets. Um, they lose some of their credits, uh, and you get less revenues. Um, so I did a calculation. Actually, I had to use CBO's calculators. They told us what uh, real bracket creep was in the baseline, and then I said, well, we have about half the productivity growth, um, and so I take about half of it and spread it over 25 years. Um, so I calculate that the revenues as a share of GDP because of this real bracket creep are going to be a half a percent lower in 2042 under the low productivity scenario. Now, of course, actual revenues are much lower because, you know, over time, lower productivity means things are getting slower and lower and lower relative to what otherwise would be, but it's about a half a percent of GDP. So I'm going to show you, I'm going to have a table again where I show you all these pieces that I don't, you don't have to remember them. I'm going to show you what they all are and then add them up and look at the primary deficits. Okay. All right. So now we're on outlay. So we got Social Security, Medicare, and discretionary, and Medicaid take up a lot. Uh, and then some income security, which I'll talk about, and there's interest, and then some other stuff. Okay, so on Social Security, I am not going to tell you a lot because Axel just went through the math. Um, in the United States, we do have a situation where once you're retired, your benefits are not indexed to wages anymore. They are indexed to inflation, which means they don't go down when productivity slows. They don't go up when productivity increases either. Um, but so we're so what that means is since your your Social so the Social Security benefits don't go down, but GDP does, that Social Security benefits as a share of GDP goes up. Okay, so that's a place where we have fiscal pressure coming from slow productivity, coming from Social Security, um, and uh, using so estimates from the Social Security actuaries, I find that the slow productivity scenario will increase um, that, oh my God, how did I do that? I'm so sorry. I am talking about this slide. Um, sorry. I changed the order last night. Uh, so um, that, that but we'll have an increase relative to GDP from Social Security benefits about a quarter percentage points over the next 25 years on average. Now I'm going back, I think. Yeah, discretionary. Okay, so we saw another big piece of spending was discretionary spending. What is that? That's the stuff that Congress appropriates it every year. It you know it pays for the IRS. It pays for like this this kind of just government stuff that are not transfer programs or tax programs. Um, all of what CBO tries to do is to say, you know, and what the exercise is, is like, what will Congress have to do to, to current law? Like, what 
What will they confront? It's hard to know what that means for something like discretionary spending because they basically decided every year. So what I did was just assume what CBO assumes. Like what will, would CBO assume about changes in discretionary spending? And what they do is a little bit weird. Um, so actually through 2021, actual discretionary spending has been fixed by legislated caps. So that's just a number, okay? So if GDP falls, that's going to go up as a share of GDP because that's fixed. Um, from 2021 to 2027, they assume that discretionary spending moves with inflation. So over the next 10 years, discretionary spending would not be expected to move with GDP growth. Therefore, if GDP falls, discretionary spending will go up, another source of fiscal pressure. For their long-run forecasts after 2027, CBO assumes that discretionary spending continues to move with GDP. So we're going to have, at the end of 10 years, a higher level of discretionary spending relative to GDP, and that higher level persists throughout the forecast. Okay? All right. Now. All right, Medicare. Medicare is the other big piece. So, you know, Medicare projections are really, really uncertain. Uh, and health spending in general is really hard to predict. It's, we don't understand, we, you know, it's been growing very fast for a very long time. We know it can continue to grow that fast forever. It has slowed recently, but over a long period of time, it tends to increase as a share of GDP. Uh, every forecasting agency sort of assumes it's going to slow some point because otherwise it goes to 100% of GDP. And how they do it, you know, differs across agencies. What CBO does is, so for the first 10 years where they're always doing a 10-year very detailed budget outlook for Congress, they go through every little provision in Medicare and sort of piece by piece uh, determine and what's going to happen with Medicare spending. After that, they take a very formulaic approach. And the formulaic approach that people take is to talk about the excess cost growth. You might have heard that term. Excess cost growth is how much faster than GDP is healthcare spending, with an implicit assumption is it's, le it's growing at least as fast as GDP, but it might be growing faster. Um, so if you have this formulaic approach that sort of specifies your rate of excess cost growth going down over time, as CBO does, um, then you're basically not going to have an effective productivity, right? Because you're going to say it's going to move with GDP GDP plus something. Um, and so uh, Medicare to GDP basically should not change. And forgetting about the formulaic approach, um, you know, we tend to think that there is an income elasticity for health spending. That is, when you look across country evidence, it's at least one. So assuming that Medicare spending as a share of GDP stays constant is basically saying we have an income elasticity of one for health spending and Medicare stays of the same. Now, this is, this is the change. I mean, Medicare spending is growing over time because of health spending growth and aging, but Changing productivity growth doesn't change the aging piece. So, so anyhow, nothing coming from Medicare, no extra pressure from Medicare is what I'm assuming coming from the productivity slowdown. Okay, so the other question I had was thinking about other mandatory spending. So another kind of thing the government does is have means-tested, needs-based programs, right? Anti-poverty programs, those can be the EITC. The EITC is the Earned Income Tax Credit. You'd say, well, didn't I already do that in taxes? Uh, I did some of it in taxes, but the way the U.S. does it, the refundable part, which is about 85%, is, actually shows up as spending. So some of the EITC shows up in taxes, some goes in spending. Um, so there are these programs that are based on web on your needs, okay? Uh, and they provide some benefits. So you have to think, well, how does productivity change el eligibility for the programs? And how does it change um, how much people who become eligible get it? Um, so the way I sort of summarize it is let's think about the impact of productivity growth on poverty, right? So if we have slower productivity growth, will we have more poverty and therefore more people eligible for Medicaid, uh, the EIDC, you know, SSI, and other means-tested programs? Um, and one thing that's kind of interesting, so when you think this is a little small graph on the right-hand side, but the poverty rate is not, in the United States, the way it's defined, is not a relative rate. It's not the bottom 10% bottom of the population. It's some fixed basket that increases with inflation. So you might think that over time, poverty just naturally goes away as productivity growth works its way through the system and everybody's wages go up, that poverty would go away, but it hasn't. It's been extremely flat for decades. Um, so that's kind of a puzzle, like, well, does productivity growth uh, contribute to, to poverty? Um, and so um, I think the answer is that it actually does. Um, how much really you have to decide empirically. Like, if someone doesn't work at all, then wage growth doesn't help them, right? It doesn't make them less poor. Um, and if a bunch of people are very poor and sort of at the low end of the poverty rate, then a lot of wage growth might keep them not still poor and still qualifying for these programs, although they may ha might have more income. Anyhow, so I try to figure out what the impact will be by using research that looks at what happens when you hold the income distribution constant and you change the median wage, and you do see that there is a rel relationship between poverty and wages, and I use that relationship to try to predict what's going to happen to Medicaid spending, SSI spending, spending that are based on poverty, okay? Um, uh, okay. Uh, then you have to ask the question about how do benefit amounts 
uh, change with poverty, so you want to know how many people and how much do they get. So for Medicaid, as I said, health spending moves with GDP, so there's not going to be an aspect to that. For things like SNAP is a, is a, is a um, food stamp. Um, so food stamps are actually based on a fixed basket. I give you a certain amount. Um, those don't move with GDP. Uh, when GDP goes down, that basket is relatively more generous, just as in the case of the retirees whose pension don't change. If you get something that doesn't go up with, with productivity, it doesn't go down with productivity. So all of that stuff adds fiscal pressure. Okay, So these are all the sources of fiscal pressure that you get from a slowdown of productivity. I know I'm going fast. But I have a lot of slides. Um, OK, so here's uh, actually the, the putting five. Is that a five? OK, great. OK, so if you look in the, on the let's just look uh, in the middle column. This is going through each piece. Uh, that I've gone through. The discretionary spending, Social Security, Medicare, other med mandatory, and revenues. So revenues go down on average by two-tenths of a percentage point. Um, discretionary spending goes up by two-tenths. Social Security goes up by three-tenths. You add it all up, you get about an increase of 1% in the primary deficit on average over um, 25 years. If you look at the picture, that's sort of you just double it to get the, the effect at in 25 years, right? It's always going to be getting bigger and bigger over time. Um, and so the blue line is the baseline primary deficits under CBO, and the and the reason they're increasing is because of population aging and, and health spending. Uh, and then the red line is what happens, how much worse they are if you have um, a slowdown in productivity like uh, like our baseline scenario, like our downside scenario. Okay. So what does that mean for debt to GDP? Well, so you have increased primary deficits, and then you can just work those through the system to figure out what happens to your debt to GDP ratios, and it depends on what you assume about interest rates, right? So if you have interest rates falling, it's not as bad to have bigger primary deficits because you're getting some savings from the fact that your interest rates are falling. So these are the four lines that show the blue is the baseline, uh, and then the three other three scenarios I talked about, if you have no change in interest rates, you have a very, very big impact uh, on the debt. Um, and then if you have some change in interest rates, what's interesting about it is no matter what you assume about the change in interest rates up to two to one, I mean, if you went higher at some point, it would, would switch, is you're still worse off than under the baseline. And here's the easy way to look at it. This is what the debt to GDP ratio is in 2042, after 25 years, um, with the primary deficit changes as I showed you, and assuming and deciding what you think about interest rates. Okay, so if there's no interest rate ad adjustment, you go from 130 to 170% of GDP. Uh, if it's one for one, I get 157% of GDP. And if it's two for one, it, it goes from 130% in the baseline to 143. So it's worse no matter what, but the more interest rates adjust downward as productivity adjusts downward, the less dramatic that effect is. Okay, so that's federal. So I have like three minutes for state and local. Um, I'm not going to actually go through it all. I'm just going to tell you the, the bottom line for state and local because I have some slides at the end about thinking about policies that I think is worth talking about. So the state and local sector, the thing to remember, the thing to know is that their tax system is much less progressive uh, and the tax rates are much lower. So with the much less progressive tax system, it doesn't, there's not much real bracket creep, right? Because most people are in the top tax, tax bracket already. So their taxes are basically going to move with um, GDP. One question is, what about property taxes, which are not a big deal for the, for the federal, but are a big deal for states? And that's interesting, because then you again have to decide what happens to asset values and property values, and that depends on your interest rate assumption. But with a one-for-one -one interest rate assumption, you basically will say that property taxes also would move with GDP. Um, and their spending also mostly is not going to, most of their spending is discretionary spending for teachers, uh, firefighters, um, so there's some Medicaid spending, but most of their spending also, they, and they have balanced budget requirements. So most of their spending will, because they'll have to balance it, move with GDP, but it shouldn't be that hard because to the extent wages in the economy are falling, then um, the wages that they have to pay their teachers fall as well. Um, and I, okay, I'm going to go to right to my conclusions. If you want to look about what I say about pension plans and interest rates, there, it's in the paper for state and local pensions because that is something you hear about a lot. Um, but again, I don't think the state and local sector, even including all their pension plans, is a very big deal. I think the big action really is at the federal government for the slowdown in productivity, so it's fine to concentrate on that, but you kind of have to look. Okay. All right, so my last... Um, slides that I'm going to go to um, are, I have just two thoughts on, on sort of like policy responses, okay? So what I show you is that the slowdown is going to require some offsets. The first thing I sort of thought about was, well, what, why shouldn't everything just be indexed? Then we wouldn't have to, you know, worry about this. Um, and I think the lack of indexation isn't like a mistake, right? So to the extent we want to provide some floor not a relative floor, but an absolute floor, it makes perfect sense to think that what we're providing is some benefit that doesn't 
go up with GDP growth. It doesn't go down when GDP growth slows either. It just says this is what we think is the minimum acceptable level of consumption. So we wouldn't want necessarily all pieces uh, of spending to move with GDP. Um, and the other thing to remember, you know, I kind of got confused because I'm doing this exercise about the impact of slower GDP growth. But really, the reason GDP growth matters for the federal sector is that when GDP goes up, the federal sector takes more of it. It's a good thing. Um, so that uh, when GDP slows, then it gets less and it's, an, it's, an, it's a problem. But it's basically like the elasticity of the federal revenues and less their spending is greater than one for one with GDP. So one of the reasons our outlook isn't even worse than it is is because we expect there still to be productivity growth and that's going to be helping the outlook, Okay. And the other thing I want to talk about is like I don't I don't really have I don't think it's up to an economist to say where to cut and where not to cut and different you know you views on on uh, income distribution will leave you to different places. But one thing that is an economic argument is don't probably don't cut investment. Now you might say if productivity is slowing, maybe the rate of return on investment is going to go down. That's possible. Um, but um, it may also be that the slowdown in productivity growth is because we haven't been doing a very good job of doing the investments that we need in infrastructure, in education. Um, and also, we haven't really responded. Like we've been slowing, slowing investment even while GDP growth has been high. We are probably behind the curve. There are probably a lot of really good, higher than the interest rates, certainly investments out there that could help us. And my last plea is, to, is when we think about not cutting investment, uh, is that a lot of things are investment that may not seem like investment. Uh, there is a lot of recent research that shows that things like providing Medicaid to poor families, even income transfers to poor families, certain education, has very high returns in the long run. So if what we're trying to say is, boy, we have this bad fiscal outlook, you know, don't do things that are going to you know, slow productivity further, cut wages. Instead, invest where you think you can have high returns. With interest rates this low, you, there's really a lot of opportunity for an increasing investment um, at, at the federal sector. Thank you so much. Wow, <clears throat> Louise has a has a way of making this exciting. Okay, uh, so so it's it's a real pleasure to to be discussing these these two papers. Let me see if I can get this to work. Oh, God. I, I should know this. The bottom one. OK. The bottom. Yes, good. Very good. OK, so, so it's a great pleasure. So, so these are two great papers, and, and they're, two, uh, they're, they're great for two reasons. One is, you know, we asked these people a question, and they just gave us the answer. And I think, you know, it's basically the truth. Uh, I think these are very well-founded, careful answers. And the other reason is that um, they are very, very, very transparent. So you know exactly what goes on in these papers, maybe a little less on the state and local part, but <laughs> that's in the nature of the of the exercise. So what would I, uh, I have a, in, in that sense a tough job because these are virtually two perfect papers, hard to discuss. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and Put them in a context, and and this context requires me to actually do something unusual for a discussion, which is go to go back to another session, uh, the first session uh, uh, today. So I'm going to try and and find uh, out what these two papers, uh, and and generally maybe the combination of the papers in the first session, this one really tell us about the the question uh, at the top of the slide. Could fiscal sustainability be threatened by sustained lower productivity growth? And, and so I will start by reminding you of the message, not from this session, but from session one. And so the way it started is Neil put up these two equations, what I'm putting up again in, in, in very slightly different form. And basically, there, there are two important equations. One tells you something about the dynamics of debt to GDP. Uh, so this is how debt to GDP evolves over time. Uh, and as you can see, it depends both on the on the gross interest rate, which is the the top um, in the, uh, which is in the in the numerator of of that coefficient, and on the uh, uh, gross real interest uh, real growth rate, which is in, in the denominator. And then it depends on the primary surplus, which is the difference between taxes and non-interest uh, expenditure. And so in steady state, so if you assume that dt plus one equals dt, and you drop the time subscripts. This gives you a, an equation, and you can interpret that equation, uh, it's the second equation, as telling you, giving you a condition of what the primary surplus needs to be or the primary deficit in order to make the debt sustainable in the sense that it doesn't move, right? It doesn't go up, it doesn't go down. 
And, and so, you know, the basic uh, insight is that the answer depends a lot on the sign of, uh, of R minus G. And so on that basis, you know, Neil's answer to the, to the question uh, uh, at the top of the slide was that we really shouldn't be very um, uh, worried because, uh, as he argues using his model and also with, with some evidence, uh, if uh, G, uh, the uh, rate of growth, and in there is the rate of productivity growth falls, R will generally fall by about as much, maybe even more, then he reminds us that some uh, economies actually may be disconnected from the fall in, in G, but they will benefit uh, from the fall in interest rates uh, because they uh, rely on world financial conditions, they are financially integrated. And, and so it's a pretty benign message, but with a very important caveat, which is, like Neil pointed out, uh, even though R is, is currently smaller than, than G in many countries, this could revert, right? So that was sort of the, the, the warning. But generally, it was sort of a benign message. And then we had Elena come and um, basically gives us a somewhat different message. And, and the way I would interpret it is that she says, look, if you stare at that equation, R minus G is not all that matters. And this is sort of inspired by the empirical observation that when you see big movements in debt, for the most part, they're not caused, or not accounted for by, by differences in, in R minus G over time, but they are accounted for sort of big changes in just the debt stock, so this thing suddenly goes up because of a financial crisis or the primary, uh, the primary surplus or primary uh, deficit. And so what we really need to worry is whether in the context of lower productivity growth and a lower interest rate environment, we could in some sense endogenously uh, get some action here or here that makes the debt uh, unsustainable. And she argues that that's actually likely to be the case. No? And we have some some intuition from Louise's um, a, a, a paper for why that might be the case. So there could be social pressures that actually do uh, go in the direction of uh, increasing the primary deficit. And then a point made uh, by Elena is that, and, and also in some sense corroborated by what Olivier Jeanne said in his uh, discussion, is that in a low growth, low interest environment, you can actually get more financial crises. Now, I just want to make a parenthetical point. So. I completely take these arguments, but they really make sense only if there's a change, if there's a chance, sorry, this is not supposed to be changed, chance of a reversion to a positive uh, uh, R minus G environment. And, and the reason is that if, if you start from this equation holding, so debt does not change, and R is smaller than G, so basically what this equation gives you is sort of a a maximum uh, primary deficit consistent with unchanged debt. And then you sort of blow another hole into the fiscal uh, uh, account, so the primary deficit falls, it becomes, it becomes bigger. Then if you were in an environment that we're normally thinking about where R is bigger than G, you would just get the debt ratio to explode. But that's not the case uh, when you are in this environment where R is smaller than G, and you can see it from this coefficient. So if R is smaller than G, it means that this coefficient is going to be smaller than one. And so what will then happen if you suddenly raise the primary deficit is you're going to get debt rising, but you're going to get debt rising at smaller and smaller and smaller steps. And as you iterate through that, you land at a new higher debt level, which is again in equilibrium. And so debt is always sustainable in this R minus G uh, is smaller than zero uh, environment, right? And so all these worries are extremely important, but they're important because we don't really trust uh, R to remain smaller than G forever. And of course, we particularly don't trust it in the types of cases that Elena explained, which is these sharps rises in, in, in debt because of a financial crisis, no? Because then, you know, investors could really get scared and then maybe the rate that applies to the government is the risky, uh, the risky rate. So that's my comment uh, on that. Okay, but you know, now with this caveat that R uh, smaller than G might not be forever, uh, you know, the really important question for uh, uh, sustainability is really, uh, are there reasons why in the type of environment in which we are in, we might fear bigger primary deficits or, or sharper rises in, in contingent debt? And so why might we fear uh, these things? And so I've written down uh, four possible uh, reasons why we, might, why we might expect that. The first one is what 
basically Louis's paper is all about, which is there could be mechanical elements, sort of the structure of the tax and entitlement and, and discretionary spending system that um, lead to a primary, high primary deficit or lower primary surplus when productivity growth uh, slows. Uh, another potential reason, right? We now know the answer, but you know that's why I have the question mark here. Another potential reason is maybe the sustainability of public pensions. So, if public pensions are not sustainable, that would either lead to, um, a, you know, a, a, a potential contingent liability. So, you can interpret it as the D uh, tilde going up, or you can interpret it as, you know, the pension system might require transfers from the budget, which would threaten fiscal sustainability. Um, then, an important uh, uh, a third point is that, you know, even if the public pension system or the social spending system doesn't by itself blow up, it might become sort of increasingly less generous and then lead to pressures uh, to deal with it somehow. And that, again, sort of the endogenous reaction of the political system to it might lead to a blow up. And then sort of the fourth reason why uh, maybe in the type of environment we are in, we might see um, an increase in the primary deficit. This is what I call the intellectual force of Larry Summers, which is sort of this, this uh, appeal that, you know, R smaller than G is the time to splurge. And indeed, there is a good basis for that appeal, not, not only because you think that this might be the time to, or the, the, a good approach to get out of secular stagnation, but also because it has this property that you cannot actually make the debt unsustainable by uh, splurging, as long as that's the case. It's impossible. And, and so basically what, what we are doing in the session is we are exploring the first three arguments in, in, in its full nitty gritty for two cases. One, sort of an international perspective where we only focus on pension systems, and then a US perspective where we focus on all uh, aspects of, of public finance. Now, before I sort of just say something quickly about these two papers, what I wanted to find out is whether the raw data itself tells you something about whether in an environment of low productivity growth, you're more likely to see increases in the primary deficit, or alternatively, in an environment where R minus G shifts down, right? So you have more fiscal space, if you like, from the financing side, whether you also get more primary deficit. So I did what economists do in those cases. I asked... Um, uh, my RA, who's great, to, to come up with some scatter plots. And, and so these are the scatter plots. So what I uh, compared is on this axis here at the bottom is the change in the average growth rate um, from uh, the, you know, if you like, the post-productivity slowdown decade, uh, which is 2006 to 2016, minus uh, average growth in, uh, from 95 to 2005. And then here is the corresponding change in the primary balance. And so, you know, we have a whole bunch of advanced countries. And what you see here is a positive correlation, which is sort of what you would expect. Namely, if growth slows, you're more likely to see, uh, uh, the, you're, you're likely to see an increase in the primary deficit. So that's sort of essentially Louise's story. But it's not a hugely uh, uh, steep, curve, and, and more importantly, it's a terrible correlation, right? And the, the reason that correlation is terrible is because you have some of these outliers here, like Latvia, that right, suffers a huge downbreak, but, you know, they just do brutal fiscal adjustment, you know? They don't actually, uh, they don't actually uh, increase their primary deficit. And then you have sort of wimpier countries, if you like, on this side, like the UK, um, Belgium, New Zealand, the United States, where you have a very big, uh, very big movement. So it really depends on country specifics, which is why we still need Moody's, right? So this is, you know, they figure out, they need to figure out how this looks in, in each of those countries. It, when you look at this, the same uh, chart, but now you have changes in R minus G. Um, so, so this is, if you like, this, this, this chart should capture the, the, the Schäuble worry, right? The Schäuble worry is that if financing conditions get easier, then you're gonna start splurging. Right? So again, if that Schäuble worry is true, you would expect to see a, a positive uh, correlation, but you don't. It's a negative correlation. So prima facie here, if you look at this, we shouldn't worry too much about it. Okay, so now the, the papers, as I read them, essentially corroborate this view. We should not worry too much from the perspective of sustainability of, of systems. Um, and, and so uh, this is... Um, a, a true in the case of uh, Axel's paper because of this fundamental uh, a property 
that in most systems, pension levels are actually indexed to wage levels with a very few exceptions. And then the point he makes is that even when this is combined with aging pressures, the pension growth will not slow to the point where pensions would fall in real terms, right? Those were these, his, his nice lines, line chart. And then we have this great paper by Louise that looks at the effect through all uh, US fiscal channels, and it's a bit less sanguine. Uh, but in the end, you know, I, I mean, the, the number after 25 years, the potential additional debt that we might see looks pretty dramatic, right? Between 13 and 40 uh, um, extra points of GDP. But, you know, for me as a sort of a, and you know, once an IMF economist, always an IMF economist, I think of it more in these terms, that we could fix the problem with a fiscal adjustment of just 1% of GDP. Right? In that sense, it's not so uh, super dramatic. So should we relax? And so relative to at least my price, the answer is yes, but there are two important caveats. The first point I've already talked about, it's this worry that this is the type of environment that leads to big quasi-fiscal liabilities if we may not realize that it does before it's too late. But then the one point I wanted to sort of briefly <laughs> expand on is the point you made as a disclaimer, uh, Louise, in your presentation, which is what if lower productivity growth is actually a reflection of or interacts with increasing inequality? And so both Axel and Louise's paper abstract from this point. They just assume that productivity growth and hence wage growth will slow across all wage groups. And so here's my last slide before the conclusion. So I, I, I take this example from Axel's paper, which is, you have, uh, imagine you have a, a baseline productivity increase of 1.5, and then the slowdown scenario is 0.9%. So this is sort of the European case. At the same time, you have an increase in the dependency ratio, which is a sort of a real cost to the system, by 0.5%. And so if you think of it, which is sort of the simplest way as in my mind to think of it as a defined contribution system, what this means is that the dependency ratio increase will cause everything else equals a fall in the replacement rate. Now, if you think now of two groups, a high-wage group, um, which I assume is 60% of, of people, and a low-wage group with, a, with like the bottom 40%. Now, if, if the slowdown equally affects both groups, then absolute pensions increase, even in the slowdown scenario, by 0.5, by, by 0.4. So it's just you know, the productivity increase minus uh, the cost of aging, and, and the result is still positive. That's Axel's point. But now it could also be that, in fact, the right way of thinking about this average productivity growth number is as, as the average of two things. One is the productivity growth and wage growth in the high, uh, gr uh, high wage group, which just continues at 1.5%. At and the other one is, is the wage and productivity growth in the low wage group, which is zero. Okay, then of course, the pension increase in this low group would be minus 0.5%. And if you think of the level of the pension as being quite low to begin with because of low wages and a low initial replacement rate, then this could uh, create a, a poverty problem and precisely the types of political pressures uh, that, um, th that we are worried about going into these uh, papers. So to conclude, uh, the impact of a sustained slowdown in productivity growth on fiscal sustainability appears to be less dramatic than you might have thought, mainly, I think, for three reasons. One is, you know, the big message from this morning's session that a lower than expected G likely also implies a lower than expected R, so it's sort of bad news and good news for the government. Second, then pensions and most other government outlays are indexed to wages or GDP. And then the third point is you, we really haven't assumed a real disaster scenario, right? I mean, we have a 0.6% uh, downbreak, um, and, and this is just not dramatic enough to create a large poverty problem, uh, forcing a sharp increase in social spending. But then there are these two caveats, and the most interesting caveat for me is this interaction of the slowdown with inequality, which I'm glad to say the next session will be all about. Thank you.
I want to thank our speakers for two very interesting papers. I don't know if it's because I'm getting older or because my children are entering the labor force, but I read these papers with quite a bit of interest, particularly looking to the issue of uh, generational conflict. Uh, and you, both your papers spoke to that in different ways. Uh, thank you, Jeremy, for your comments, which uh, I think really helped us to see the connections between the two papers or provided a framework within which we can understand how these contributions fit together. So it was, so far, a very interesting session. Um, we'll start with some questions. I'm going to ask one, and then we'll hope uh, that the audience will join us. Please step to the microphone and uh, give us your name and uh, fire away. So let me begin with a question um, that comes out a little bit out of experience. Any of you who have TIA CREF <laughs> or any other pension, you go to your pension advisor, and they run lots of simulations. They tell you very proudly, you know, I've run 10,000 or 100,000 simulations, <coughs> and you're going to be just fine until, you know, you're 105 or whatever. And um, when I read these papers, I became quite comforted, as did Jeremy, because I thought it was going to be a disaster scenario. And I thought, this is a ways out. We've got some ways to adjust. Particularly with Axel's paper, I felt, well, this is not the disaster that I thought it was. In fact, it may be no big deal. But then I wondered about the parameter values that you use. We might think of these as sort of central tendencies, but then we know that we have these outlier, you know, these events that can happen. And I'm wondering about kind of the confidence intervals around this in some sense. So I wondered uh, if you could answer the following question. When you were doing your analysis, uh, which parameter values gave you the most concern? What is it that you worried about that you might not be capturing? Or, or none of the above? Uh, so, so uh, Axel, you did a little bit of sensitivity analysis with thinking what happens um, if, uh, if we have the uh, changes in aging. But there are other issues uh, related to the relationship between interest rates and productivity, which, which Louise stressed. But which ones really gave you the most concern? Axel, you want to start? Well, for the, the, the analysis of the pay as you go system is essentially playing with budget constraints. So uh, there are actually very few, uh, uh, well, indirectly that's a little bit, but uh, there, there are virtually no behavioral parameters. Uh, so in that sense, it's, uh, it's, it's a fairly robust analysis. Now, uh, I'm, I'm, th this is only to a first extent. Uh, <clears throat> uh, th there was one line which was pretty much fine print. Um, the, 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 the first wages may actually react to productivity in a different way than uh, assumed here, so this was one to one. That is a strong assumption. Um, uh, <clears throat> we know that there's staggered wage contracts, uh, which uh, actually may, uh, may have a, a delayed response of wages to productivity, and that creates some trouble. Uh, labor supply may, may change. Actually, that was alluded to, I don't know, remember by whom. Uh, in an earlier paper where, uh, where it says when wages go down, maybe labor supply will go down. Actually, we have some evidence on that. Uh, the, the elasticity is very small, uh, so I'm not really worried. Uh, the, uh, the, the, probably the gorilla in the room is the, uh, the relation between the interest rate and, and productivity, which is relevant not for pay as you go systems, but uh, or only indirectly for pay as you go systems, but very strongly for fully funded systems. Now, uh, we spend a major part of the, uh, uh, of the morning in trying to understand that relation. Uh, and I think, uh, as we have seen, uh, 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 we have quoted the, uh, the truck which goes through the uh, confidence interval uh, quite a few times. So that, that is probably the, the, the highest uncertainty we have. I want to actually, um, instead of t talking just about, about parameters, just think about the question you asked, which was, so imagine that instead of having a system where uh, Social Security, where, where outlays automatically went down with productivity, they didn't, right? Then we would say, we do this analysis and we'd say, oh my God, we're going to have a terrible problem. But now we're feeling better because instead of having to slower Medicare spending, it goes automatically. So in some sense, you don't want to get too much comfort by saying, well, we're not going to have to make adjustments. The reason we don't have to make adjustments is because everything is going to be lower, Right? And it's just, it happens automatically. So it's almost more of a political question than an economic question um, about, you know, what has to happen 
right? So we're just saying you don't, you're not going to take the choices because the rules are written that these choices are made for you as well. So, so don't take so much comfort. You know, your social security benefits are going to be lower because we have lower productivity. It's just Congress is not going to have to chew it. <laughs> um, and in terms of the parameters, I mean, clearly, obviously, interest rate uh, assumption um, and the income distribution, I think, are pretty key um, to, to figuring this out. But again, uh, the rest of it is sort of just taking kind of rules, not economic. There was not like when he says very simple papers, it's because we we're just kind of saying, well, here's the way the system works, and I'm just going to feed through the changes. We weren't incorporating. I mean, actually, there's nothing in what I did that took into account of things like changes in labor force participation, um, uh, you know, changes, there's so many things could change if we really had a lower productivity for a very long time in ways that I think we don't even really know how to think about. So I think we should remember that there are, there are wide confidence intervals, part, partly because we don't even know what the, you know, what differences in household composition, and like there's so many areas where things could matter about low productivity growth for a sustained period of time that are not in my analysis. Thank you both. Um, let's start with our first question at the mic. If you please identify yourself. <clears throat> yes, um, Romain Deval from the IMF Research Department. Thanks a lot, great presentations. Um, I wanted to push one line that Jermaine started to push and which is gonna be your topic of the next session, which is in a way distributive issues now. Uh, there's growing research that suggests that in fact the productivity slowdown may be connected to you know falling labor share, rising inequality, that is unequal distribution of even that decline in the labor share. Um, not clear about causality, but I think if these phenomena are concomitant, you know, how would that affect maybe your, your assessment of fiscal sustainability? For instance, you know, if the labor share continues to decline going forward and low skilled workers are disproportionately affected. You know, in a world where you still have minimum non-contributory pensions that have to keep subsistence levels, you know, would this fiscal sustainability be affected? And quantitatively, have you got any sense of whether this would be, you know, small or maybe not small? And related to this is, if that's the case, you know, is there any any case for shifting a little bit the the financing of the of pension systems away from labor toward other sources? Uh, in particular, our beverage systems, you know, that rely more on general taxation, more immune to this problem. So, you know, have you got any any thoughts on, on again, the, like financing of the system in such a way? Thanks a lot. Thank you. Who would like to tackle that first? The broader question, which is actually, I'm I'm, at, I'm not sure how it goes, because if you think about it, if if we think that the slowdown of productivity is not going to hurt income at the top then you're going to have much better outlook for taxes um, that could actually help the system. Um, and so it's also true that you'll have more need at the bottom. So that's what I'm saying. I think it goes in both ways, which is if um, low-income people, they, their, their, their tax contributions are much lower. So I think you're, you might on net be better off, even considering the fact that your Medicaid spending will go up and your SSI spending, um, and you'd have to check. But it's not clear. Uh, so, and you didn't do the pension work. Yeah, um, an interesting question is what haps, happens to what, sort of the socially accepted subsistence level. Now, in the past, we have seen this increasing all the time uh, because in general there was growth. Uh, the question is whether that goes uh, into reverse. Uh, uh, we, we, we do not really have a lot of, uh, of uh, historical experience except catastrophes. Uh, like uh, after World War II or after World War I, when also subsistence levels were new, newly defined much lower than that. Uh, so it's not a good answer to, to, to your question. We do not know. Uh, but in general, I would, I would think if, if a society for a long time realizes that it's shrinking and shrinking and shrinking, subsistence level will also shrink. Um, the other question about uh, whether pensions should be financed by uh, by taxes on uh, on, on capital. Uh, <laughs> um, usually, the, this question is phrased in a different way, uh, sort of thinking about uh, uh, the, uh, the digitalization and uh, the demise of uh, work. Everything will be done by robots. Uh, should we then uh, have a uh, social security tax on robots? Um, <clears throat> now. Um, 
my, my, my point is, uh, if you, you, you look at how income is generated, uh, and when income is generated, that, that is exactly where you should uh, tax and, uh, and also tax Social Security for this. Uh, even with the productivity slowdown, uh, you, you will still see uh, the, that the majority is by labor income. So uh, I don't see we, we, we need to do a major taxation change here. Uh, <clears throat> if, if, if there's a dramatic change so that we essentially uh, generate most of our income by, by capital and very little by labor, uh, then we'll come back to, to your question. But uh, this is not in the uh, uh, dimension uh, of, of changes that we actually see in, that, uh, in these exercises. <clears throat> Great, thank you. The gentleman at the table, did you? I think you were next. I was just wondering if anyone had thought, oh, Michael Miller from uh, Ziff Brothers. I was just wondering if anyone had thought about the impact of productivity rates being different in different sectors. Yeah. In particular, healthcare productivity has been much slower than overall <laughs> productivity, and yet it's a larger percentage of government spending. I just wondered if any of you had thought about that. Well, no, so, so there's a big question, I think, in my view, of whether or not we measure healthcare productivity. I mean, we don't measure it well. So our measures of prices have very little in terms of quality changes. Um, uh, and so I think, you know, people who've done work on trying to say what happens if we try to measure for quality uh, will see that um, actually there is much more productivity in the health sec sector than we think. Now, the other thing that's kind of interesting from a federal perspective is that what, one of the things the ACA did was change the way medical providers are paid so that they take the increase in your input prices, your basket, like whatever you know your, your, it costs you, and they subtract 10-year average multi-factor productivity for, for the economy as a whole from that. So they're basically saying, we expect you to get that productivity, and we're not paying you for that. So from a fiscal perspective, um, so changing that multi-factor productivity um, will uh, affect Medicare spending just sort of directly uh, because there is that that piece of it. Um, but in terms of thinking about the slowdown, I think there is a there is a question of you know as we move more into a service economy where measured productivity is much lower, is that one of the reasons for the slowdown? And, and that will continue. So so healthcare as a share of GDP is going to hit twenty five percent in twenty years. It's huge. Um, so I think it's very, it's a very important question, um, but I actually think the measurement issues are huge in that. Um, so uh, it's actually another project I'm working on. Now this sounds extremely cynical, but uh, a decrease in the productivity in the health sector does help the pension system, right? <laughs> <laughs> Let's take a question from the mic. Yeah, <clears throat> my name is Joe Grease Grabber. I'm with New Rules for Global Finance. And I just wanted to insert a couple of political uh, realities to the debate, which has been extremely informative. First of all, there's a book called Living in the United States on $2 a Day. And you will find that when we talk about the subsistence level in the United States, it's be below grim. It is hideous. Um, on a more positive note, you might note that old people vote. So regardless of what you think conceptually about you know, social security going down and we're thinking of the next generation, we vote. Young people tend not to. So there is a political element you need to factor in. <clears throat> and then finally, um, why is there such low productivity now and the stock market is going through the ceiling? Okay, those are big ones. <laughs> <laughs> Louise, you want to start on this one? Um, so, well, so in terms of like living in the United States, so I, I sort of that was part of my plea about investment. 
um, in some sense, which is I think that there are a lot of unexploited opportunities where things like even just helping out low-income families with money, with cash, can be considered an investment because it makes a huge difference to people growing up, the circumstances which they're growing, what kind of opportunities they have, what kind of education they pursue. Um, and so I do think that, you know, but that's a personal perspective. There's a huge, there's a lot of scope for doing more of that kind of thing and not thinking of, it, of that as necessarily making our long-term fiscal outlook worse, but thinking of it as an investment in our long-term fiscal outlook. Um, the fact that older people vote, um, I think, is one of the reasons um, why you see kind of poverty rates of the older people have come down a lot, where, where for the non-elderly they have not. Um, and uh, you know, I think an interesting question is, as this goes on and uh, more of the budget is ends up being concentrated on people 65 and older, whether or not those voting patterns start to change. I mean, can you, you can't imagine at some point um, those things changing uh, in response. Um, so, but neither Axel or I really thought about, there were no sort of policy changes. We weren't cutting benefits or we're just sort of pu pushing through the implications of uh, the productivity on, on uh, legislation as it exists. And I don't think that uh, there would be a response to that from the, from the older people. I actually did a lot of thinking about the political economy of pensions. Um, now, the, the U.S. in, uh, I'm a little hesitant to say this, uh, in, in, in so many aspects is the outlier and not the rule. So in the U.S., you haven't seen a major pension reform since 1983. That's a long time. Uh, whereas in the countries where, where you think uh, the unequal voting uh, would actually really put more pressure on the pension system, almost the opposite happened. Italy had, has major reforms in the pension system, uh, Italy, uh, and with its political system and uh, a, a much different age structure than, uh, than the United States. Also in Germany, we had major pension reforms uh, during the last uh, 10, 15 years. Um, so in spite of uh, a majority, a larger majority of older people relative to the U.S., uh, these countries actually push through pensions, pens pension reforms to the advantage of the younger generation rather than the older generation. So I, it's, it's, it's a complicated uh, but, uh, a theme. And another thing which actually we did a lot of research on is uh, we, 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 we looked at how uh, political strife between the older and younger generation depends on the age uh, structure of the population. And the result is essentially it does not. Uh, and uh, you, you do not really find systematic uh, uh, relations there. So I would not be as pessimistic as you were. <clears throat> yeah, please, Chairman. So, so I don't really know much about the stock market. I, I want, wanted to make one, one observation. So I, I presume your, your question on, you know, why is the stock market so high, e even though we think uh, productivity growth may well slow further and has already slowed, it's not just about the very recent uh, increases, which you know have to do with with tax cuts, stimulus, and so forth, but you know more the the general uh, phenomenon. And so I think here here it is interesting to remember that alongside the slowdown of productivity, we have had an increase in profit margins. And in fact, you know the, the next session, may, maybe Jason Furman will speak about that and and argue that maybe these two things. Uh, are also uh, related, uh, and so you know maybe the stock market cares about about this increase in profit margins. You know, having said that, of course, you know there there is a risk that at some point, if uh, you know we have some of the social consequences of the productivity slowdown materialize, it will uh, you know lead to a um, you know political or taxation changes that. That reverse that, so you know it might it might be a risky uh, it might be a risky um, uh, point to be in. But even on that, we will we will have a paper in the last uh, in the last session, which is about the political consequences. Questions, please, Bill. I wonder, Louise, if you would say a bit more about whether your Medicare and Medicaid zero impact result is. An idiosyncrasy of the way the CBO treats the outer, outer years. If you assume that this category is just going to be a percent of GDP, then you're home free. 
But it seems to me, and I think that's what's happening, but it seems to me that if instead people think that they have an entitlement to get this from the system, and then that is somehow fixed in the future, as I do a back of the envelope, that's worth another one percentage point of GDP, doubling your fiscal impact. So I wonder if you could say whether that's a, how, how real a phenomenon that is, or whether, because it's very counterintuitive if you believe that the entitlement is to a, a fixed thing. Okay, so I think, um, I don't think it is uh, just because of what CBO does. So CBO is not assuming that healthcare is fixed as a share of GDP, but they're saying it's growing faster than GDP by a fixed amount. So it's grow so spending is growing over time. And, and you know, actually CMS does a different kind of uh, estimate where they, instead of doing some formulaic thing, they try to like figure out what are the factors that are determining health spending. So what Medicare entitles to, to you to is not a fixed thing. In fact, if it entitled you to a fixed thing, we'd be pretty well off right now. It entitles you, from a budget perspective, it entitles you to the standard of care as it exists at the time. So one of the things that we think is that as people grow richer, they want to spend more on health care, and, and health care tends to move with GDP and perhaps even faster than GDP. So that's kind of a luxury good. The richer you get, the more you want to spend on health care. There's new technologies. Medicare says, I give you whatever anybody else gets, right? So you might think that when you think about how is health spending going to evolve over time, that a slowdown in income growth is going to slow down health care spending commensurately because of that demand elasticity, because of, you know, uh, potential. You know, another way of thinking about it is, which could also even reinforce that is, you know, if you think that part of what's going on in healthcare is that we do have a lot of technological innovations, and those innovations say, well, now we can do stuff we never could do before, and there's a lot more demand for it because we can do it, and we can keep your li you living longer, and there are fewer side effects. That's one of the things that creates um, the increased spending over time. We're not spending more on the same stuff. We're spending more on different stuff, and then we could argue about from a productivity uh, perspective, is it better stuff? That's kind of what the productivity issue is. But we are certainly spending on more new things. And so I don't think that uh, thinking about us spending on this fixed basket, like you know, food stamps are a fixed basket, like health is a fixed basket, is right. What we are doing is spending more and more over time on things. Uh, and so a slowdown in GDP, for many pr perspectives, could slow down those things. And it could slow down the rate of innovation right, in healthcare. Um, so that there aren't as many new, you know, if, if somehow we're not able to harness, you know, computers to do new things, like part of those things also allow you to do amazing CAT scans. Um, and there's been a lot of digitalization in the healthcare industry. So if we think the slowdown is kind of in IT, you can imagine a slowdown also in the healthcare sector, which means there just wouldn't be as many new things to, to, to use. And so health spending would fall from that perspective as well. So I don't think it's a silly assumption just coming from some robotic, you know, rule of thumb. Okay, we're going to have to leave it there. I'd like to uh, ask you to join me thanking this uh, panel for this.